Hey, how's it going everyone? This is Fixer Med, and welcome back to my high yield anatomy review series for the USMLE Step 1 NBME CBSE and NBME CAS examinations. This will be part four of my multi-part video series providing a thorough overview of the anatomy discipline for these examinations. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on today's content. Today I'd like to start off talking about medial and lateral epicondylitis. Medial epicondylitis is commonly known as golfer's elbow, which involves the inflammation of the common flexor tendon of the wrist at its origin on the medial epicondyle of the humerus. I have a picture to the upper right showcasing what medial epicondylitis should look like. And then on the other hand, we have lateral epicondylitis known as tennis elbow which is characterized by repeated forceful flexion and extension of the wrist, leading to strain on the attachment of the common extensor tendon and inflammation of the peri periosteum of the lateral epicondyle. Individuals with lateral epicondylitis typically experience pain localized over the lateral epicondyle that radiates down the posterior aspect of the forearm. This pain is often exacerbated during activities such as opening a door or lifting a glass. And I have a picture of lateral epicondylitis on the bottom right for you guys to check out. These are good ways to kind of have a visual anchor to what medial and lateral epicondylitis are. Next, I'd like to talk about arterial anastomoses around the scapula. In cases of subclavian or axillary artery blockage, Bypassing is facilitated by anastomoses among branches of the thyrocervical and subscapular arteries, including the transverse cervical, suprascapular, subscapular, and circumflex scapular arteries. I've illustrated important arteries you need to know on the picture to the right. Uh, I actually didn't draw it out, but point stands. You should probably know these arteries and characteristics of these arteries, so... We'll be covering this in more detail in the MSK High Yield Review series, but just as a broad point, this should be enough to get you maybe 80% of the points if you can draw out this diagram from memory. Moving on, next we're going to be talking about the cubital fossa. From medial to lateral, you have the median nerve, you have the brachial artery, you have the bicep brachii tendon, and then the subcutaneous structures from medial to lateral include the basilic vein, the medial median cubital vein, which joins basilic and cephalic veins, then you have the cephalic vein. The median cubital vein is typically chosen for venipuncture because it overlies the bicipital aponeurosis, which provides protection to deeper structures and is not accompanied by nerves. I have an illustration of the cubital fossa on the picture to the right, courtesy of Geeky Medics. Thank you, Geeky Medics, for illustrating the cubital fossa in such a wonderful way. Let's go on and test our knowledge out of these concepts by approaching some questions. You know the deal. A medical student is practicing venipuncture and needs to select an appropriate site for the procedure. Which of the following veins is commonly chosen for venipuncture due to its anatom anatomical features? All right, I think I gave you guys enough time. Let's go ahead and move on and see what's the correct answer choice is. The median cubital vein is commonly chosen for venipuncture due to its anatomical characteristics. It is located in the cubital fossa and often overlies the bicipital aponeurosis, providing protection to deeper structures. Additionally, the median cubital vein is not accompanied by nerves, making it a relatively safe and accessible option for venipuncture. Therefore, the correct answer is C, median cubital vein. Let's go ahead and see why the other answer choices are not as good of an answer as this one. 
cephalic vein. While the cephalic vein is commonly used for venipuncture, the median cubital vein is preferred due to its central location in the cubital fossa. B. Basilic vein. The basilic vein is located on the medial aspect of the arm and is not typically chosen for vena puncture due to its deeper location and proximity to nerves. Brachial vein. There is no specific brachial vein commonly used for vena puncture. The median cubital vein is preferred for its accessibility and protective features. Radial vein. The radial vein is located on the lateral aspect of the forearm and is not a common choice for vena puncture. The median cubital vein in the cubital fossa is a more favorable option. Moving on to the next question. We have a 42 year old office worker who presents with pain localized over the lateral aspect of the elbow, which worsens when lifting objects or opening doors. Physical examination reveals tenderness over the lateral epicondyle. Which of the following conditions is most likely responsible for these symptoms? All right, that should be enough time. If you need more time, be sure to pause the video. Let's go ahead and see what the correct answer is. The patient's symptoms of pain localized over the lateral aspect of the elbow, exacerbated during activities such as opening doors or lifting objects and tenderness over the lateral epicondyle are consistent with lateral epicondylitis, also known as tennis elbow. This condition results from repeated forceful flexion and extension of the wrist, leading to strain on the attachment of the common extensor tendon and inflammation of the periosteum of the lateral epicondyle. Therefore, the correct answer is D, lateral epicondylitis. Pretty straightforward question. Let's go ahead and see why the other answer choices are incorrect. Cubital tunnel syndrome. Cubital tunnel syndrome involves compression of the ulnar nerve at the elbow, leading to symptoms such as tingling, numbness, and weakness in the ring and small fingers. It does not typically cause localized pain over the lateral epicondyle. Medial epicondylitis. Medial epicondylitis, or golfer's elbow, involves inflammation of the common flexor tendon on the median epi medial epicondyle. It presents with pain and tenderness over the medial aspect of the elbow, not the lateral aspect. Ulnar collateral ligament injury. Ulnar collateral ligament injuries are often associated with trauma or overuse and can cause instability of the elbow joint. However, they do not typically present with localized pain over the lateral epicondyle. Radial tunnel syndrome. Radial tunnel syndrome involves compression of the radial nerve near the lateral epicondyle, but it does not typically cause symptoms localized to the lateral epicondyle itself. Symptoms may include lateral forearm pain and weakness in forearm extension. Let's go ahead and check out the next question. We have a 65 year old patient who presents with cold and pale upper extremity along with diminished pulses. Imaging reveals a blockage in the subclavian artery. Which of the following arterial anastomoses plays a crucial role in bypassing blood flow to the affected region? All right, uh, I think I gave you guys enough time here. If you need more time, please be sure to pause the video. Otherwise, moving on now. 
In cases of subclavian or axillary artery blockage, bypassing is facilitated by anastomoses among branches of the thyrocervical and subscapular arteries. Key vessels involved in these anastomoses include the transverse cervical, suprascapular, subscapular, and circumflex scapular arteries. The axillary artery, a continuation of the subclavian artery, is a critical component of these anastomoses, helping to restore blood flow to the affected upper extremity. Therefore, the correct answer is D, axillary artery anastomoses. Okay, let's go ahead and see why the other answer choices are incorrect. Radial artery anastomosis. While the radial artery is an important vessel in the forearm, it does not directly contribute to the anastomoses involved in bypassing blood flow around a subclavian artery blockage. Brachial artery anastomosis. The brachial artery primarily supplies the upper arm and does not play a significant role in the anastomoses that occur to bypass a subclavian artery blockage. Ulnar artery anastomosis. The ulnar artery is a major vessel in the forearm but does not participate in the anastomoses required for bypassing blood flow around a subclavian artery obstruction. Carotid artery anastomosis. The carotid artery is not directly involved in the anastomoses related to bypassing blood flow around a subclavian artery blockage. These anastomoses primarily involve branches of the thyrocervical and subscapular arteries. Now guys, that will do it all for today's video. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to leave them in the comment section below. If not, this is Fixer Med signing off. Be sure to have a great day everyone and happy studying. Goodbye.